How's our day, people? Good. How about yourself? Good. How are you doing, Chiller? I'm enjoying it thoroughly. Nice folks. I have to say, I love your your passion. Generally speaking, it's just such a pleasure. It's one of my favorite things about this experience is really locking in. You know, it, it, it's a strange thing when you, you know you, you're moved by media to the point of wanting to collect you know things about it that remind you of it and revive those feelings and what I find is you know the minute um, the, the general polite courtesies are exchanged and you lock in and you kind of go a little deeper I'm fa I, it's just fascinating to see the, the the depth and clarity of so many you know of these interesting individuals I've met and uh, what makes them tick, and certainly what resonates, but the movies are always an interesting key to so much more, and it ain't about me. And that's what's interesting on the other side of the table. So I thank you for bringing all of your stories um, and sharing them, more to the point. It's really, it's really been interesting and uh, a pleasure. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you for saying that, because sometimes a lot of people don't say that. A lot of people come here, they don't mention that. That's nice. It's the nicest thing about it. I mean, it's, you know, we don't get it, the, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate to get to do theater once in a while, every five years or so, and you meet people after the show. Other than the, you know, the odd encounter, you know, on one-on-one -on -one when you're out there, but, um, this is like, you know, it's live analytics, and it's nice to know what people like and what resonates. And um, when someone, you know, starts hitting your talking points on a movie that you've, you know, beat the drum for or really love, and uh, or you hoped that an audience would resonate with maybe finer currents of a performance, and it just lands, and, you know, you guys got it, and it's just like, wow, there's a real connection there, and you know why you're doing it. Um, there's nothing better than that, so thank you again. So, did you want to become an actor? Um, I, was, I was fortunate enough to be exposed to classic cinema as a child. My parents were, I guess, semi-professional actors, maybe professional, maybe not. They were uh, doing theater in Chicago, and at that time, you know, it wasn't Broadway, but it, or Hollywood, but it was formidable live theater in the city. And uh, I grew up um, watching them perform, and then uh, watching the movies that inspired them. They saw Singing in the Rain 42 times when they were teenagers, you know, in the theater, right? They were, they were fanatics, but for, you know, the best of that MGM window under Arthur Freed's unit, which I think operated between 1950 and 54. There was a lot of bad musicals certainly made around those days, but there were some great ones, and they shared the best. And it was the that incredible, um, those consistent examples of the best of the human condition. Incredible specimens doing unbelievable things, coming out of vaudeville. You know, Gene Kelly. Triple threat, just crushing the people. I mean, what you know, expression of manhood is that? You know, that is that is you know, um, both romantic and tough and cool, but like an acrobat and you know, playing upon your swashbuckling kind of. You know, as a kid, you want to be Zorro or D'Artagnan, and there he's doing that. But then he's tap dancing, and then he's singing, and, and I was going, that looks like the coolest job. And he was with you know. The most beautiful women doing the equally amazing things. So, movies made me want to do movies. Um, so, what was the first movie you saw that actually No, that's a good question. But he's gonna, he's here for a reason. Right? No, actually, that was the, the question. <laughs> Thank you, Hudson. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, it might have been. I'd like to think it was Singing in the Rain, but it might have been The Pirate, which was uh, Vincent Vanelli directing his then wife, Judy Garland, with Gene. And uh, because it was, it, again, it played to a young boy's kind of 
love of Douglas Fairbanks or whatever, you know, that, that, that heroic thing, but with this, this, it was my first glimpse at, um, irony that wasn't kind of postmodern or kind of snarky. It was funny because it's a movie about actors, really. He poses as, he finds out Judy Garland's fantasy is this pirate and he pretends to be him to win her love and it gets him in trouble and nearly gets him hung. But he's an actor and it's just a joke about being, you know, you know, a vaudevillian, but in the 1700s in the Caribbean. Um, but the jokes were about modern day uh, cinema or, you know, it's a great movie, you should try to watch it, I'm sure, I think it's on every platform, more or less, maybe a couple, The Pirate. Um, and then, uh, Wolfman, well, you know, <laughs> on a black, black and white, on a black and white TV, you know, and that was spooky as hell. Right, I mean, that was just awesome. That was good. Any other questions, folks? Yeah. So back to oh, the sorry. future. Back <laughs> yes, you in front. You in front. Back to the future. So, uh, how do you recall getting the role in that? One of the larger movies that you you were recognizable facing. That was my that was my first professional gig. That was my first movie first job, other than like an industrial film right. in Chicago at 16 or something. Um, I auditioned uh, for a movie then called Paradox, which is what it was called, and um, for the Biff role, but they had already cast Biff, so they had no way of reading actors for his friends because there were no lines for his friends, you know. But they wanted to just put a mix of characters that made sense aesthetically. And um, they, uh, I read Biff and did a, you know, found the humor in it, I guess, or the reading went well, but I think it was just about type. And I remember they, Bob Gale saying, uh, I reminded him of Buzz from, um, Rebel Without a Cause. I looked like the actor, like when I was 18, I guess I looked like Buzz from Rebel. And uh, that coupled with the reading, coupled with the fact that I remember wearing that, specifically dressing for this audition in a very kind of subtle way without really hitting it on the nose. It just showed I appreciated uh, retro media and comment. I wore a Jetsons t-shirt, which was, you know, George and, you know, you know, Judy and his boy Elroy, were just all of them on there. And it was very subtle, and I didn't comment on it, but I, it was, you know, you couldn't miss it, and I knew you had to stand out. And it, and he referenced it when we were on set, and I was like, aha, it worked, you know, they remembered. They were like, you like the Jetsons, you're cool, I like the Jetsons. It's like, you know, I let Hanna-Barbera do the heavy lifting, basically. Oh, I love Hanna-Barbera, too. Yeah. So I want to jump ahead a few years to Dead Calm which uh, a really great thriller. Thank you. And you're actually uh, Chicago Film Critics, most promising newcomer. And uh, that's of note as well. Uh, is, I think that is your first award. I believe that is, yes. Um, so what can you, uh, what do you recall from Dead Calm, the filming? Um. I remember, uh, I mean, where to begin? It, it, I remember the sense, of, the feeling of nothing to lose, and every, you know, you have two windows to really kind of invent yourself when you arrive, as it were, and with a role like that, and when you come back. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I remember finding, sorry, I keep giving you, sir. Can you take one more photo? Because <laughs> I keep giving you two terrible expressions. Let's just pose one. I'll, I'll pretend it's candid. I'm like, eh, here we go. Uh -huh. <laughs> Any day now. You're a gentleman. Delete those other days. <laughs> no, literally, I'm like, I might as well be flossing or something. 
um, get calm. Phil Noyce, amazing director. Um, you know, uh, we. I remember getting, you know, wearing the same suit as him in the audition for some reason. Some weird kind of, you know, mid '80s crushed kind of weird silk thing that people wore as some like Miami Vice hangover. I don't know. It was just weird blue and he had it on and I thought, oh God, I either lost the job or I got it, you know, and like I was like, you know, we looked at each other like, yeah, sorry. And um and then I remember improvising in the me in the audition and making Huey funny while being scary. And that became kind of like a something that seemed to resonate and work and I kept reusing. I also remember Philip um, directing right next to the camera, which is such a gift, and I advise any directors in the room to utilize it. Don't go in the tent 40 yards away and direct from a watchman. Direct your actors, because we love to perform for you, you know, and give and get that immediate response. Be right next to the lens. That was awesome. And those wonderful actors in one, you know, seeing Nicole, you know, blossom and working with Sam, who I was always a fan of. It was a great pleasure. Um, and mining currents that were not necessarily in the script and given the, the, the free, you know, the encouragement to do so um, was, uh, was a great uh, privilege uh, at that early stage of my career. Yeah, you were, you were, it's really interesting. You're equally terrifying in that role and yet very, uh, uh, I, I think at the time there were a lot of women like, oh, he's so magnetic. And, and you know, the, that was the thing, you re attracted and repelled with that. That was really good. Thank you. And, and I, I think that a lot of people got that, maybe not immediately, but in retrospect, as people refer back to that, that movie and your partner, it's, it's really good. Well, the, the idea we thought was to challenge, you know, he wasn't, you know, he was a victim of trauma and acted out with a degree of hopelessness that he thought he was doomed on a sinking ship and lost the plot, definitely, you know, no question. And then suddenly, you know, the laws of man and the sea came crushing in and it, it just couldn't process, I, you know, the rationale was the dude just wanted, like, you know, to sail off into the sunset and have this a happy ending to this horrible story at the expense of you know anyone who stood in the way of that which you know thus the criminality around the behavior he, he wasn't you know born evil nor diabolical he was shaped by circumstance and we um we thought in order to make it um more unnerving was to play with the audience's sympathies a little bit where you just start to go you know yeah they're a more age appropriate couple and they were you know she was 19 i was 21 right and we were and then you know they look cute together on screen and there's moments of like and the minute you catch yourself like what am i thinking her husband's drowning on this boat you know you know you're challenged in your own sense of you know morality and and so that that we thought was a really practical um, and 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 unique uh, use of time in the narrative that could have otherwise been tedious with just three people. And if I was, you know, one note, you know, axe murderer on a boat, it would have been like whatever. No, oh, but you weren't. No, uh, Memphis Bell was another interesting role after that. Um, what do you recall about that movie? Which was, again, Chicago film critics took note of you in that. Um, it, it, that was an extraordinary experience. Most of the crew were still alive at the time and visited us while we made the film. It's a phenomenal story, of, for those who know it or don't. It was, William Wyler's film is just coming out right now. I think on limited release, they restored his film about a um, flying fortress bomber crew in World War II that were the first to achieve the uh, unachievable, which was actually make it through 25 missions over Germany. Um, the war at that time was a meat grinder and no one was making it out of there. And they had to give, you know, the idea was, you know, finally the crew had succeeded. So there was a sense of hope that these young men or something you know, might come back from these 
these these horrible daylight bombing raids. And um, but they had to persevere. They had to, you know, fighting fascism at that scale was it's just what was required of the sacrifice. And they, um, it was their last mission, and it was a it was a kind of pretty shit detail. And uh, not the PR stunt that they were told it would be. Not that they cared about that really, but they would have liked to have known it was <laughs> maybe a little easier. Um, and um, the experience was, we, you know, we went up in one of the planes on the 4th of July, which was kind of interesting. And um, it, it was made by, uh, you know, now Sir David Putnam, uh, Michael Caton Jones, great director, directing um, Richard Watkins, Wendy Watkins, we call him great master of light, incredible crew, you know, some of the best, the finest of British cinema. We shot at Pinewood on the James Bond stage, which was huge for me. I was always a huge classic Bond fan. Remember being in line at the cafeteria in Pinewood in my, you know, I love that A2 jacket and that, you know, officer's cap and World War II gear and, uh, lining up and Sean Connery was in nine next to me doing Russia House. And I've like I'm like the biggest Connery fan and I was just like, you know, another you know, it was like Gene Kelly and Sean Connery, right? It was a why'd I get in the movies. And there he was and he's like six, five. I mean the guy's enormous and just, you know, kept himself and I just I didn't bug him because you don't want to bug someone when they're eating, I guess. But I was just you know, and we were in a room that I recognized from five of the Bond movies. They made them all at Pinewood. I mean that that the cafeteria was MI6 and then Smirsh or God knows what else. But um, that was a great experience. Um, and uh, playing the bombardier in that movie was uh, was a hoot. Um, I shot Super 8 that almost identically matched some of the footage of Weiler's uh, footage, I realized, after the fact. I copied a shot uh, taking off in the nose, which is a plexiglass dome where you hang out. And you're not supposed to take off down there. You, in case there's an issue, because you got to go through the floor of the cockpit, everyone takes off in the radio room, and you can climb out a open window by the waste gunner in case something happens, which often did. I didn't know this. I was lying on my belly going, yeah, let's go, you know, and they're in the nose of this thing and watching the earth fall away and us cruise over Dover. And uh, I shot this shot that started in blackness, and as we pulled away, the shadow of the plane bouncing over the farmland, you know. And I, then I saw a documentary afterwards, I was like, ah, I did that shot, you know. <laughs> there's so many, so many places you could put the damn camera in there, but good memories. Um, so, Tombstone, which big fan favorite nowadays, well, it was, always was, right? We always caught in dialogue. What do you, what do you, can you recall about that? Um, that was, a, you know, it's an extraordinary cast. Uh, you know, Kevin Jarre's incredible script. Um, I had just finished uh, filming Posse uh, in Arizona right before him. <laughs> All right, <laughs> great, great movie. Mario Van Peebles starring and directing. East and West Coast rap representatives on horseback. Yeah. Never say that again. That was crazy. I was like, when are you gonna? Uh, it's just amazing. I loved it. Hip hop western. When are you gonna see that? I want you to do another one. It's a killer. It's a great score. Big Daddy Kane on horseback. On the time. Tone Loke. Killing it. But you asked about Tombstone. Sorry. <laughs> I had fun on them, you know. I met Isaac Hayes for Chris. That was cool. Um, so I stayed in Arizona for a long time. And then uh, drifted over to that, you know, epic. And um, I had arrived to play... Um, what, you know, your friend says, hey, I want you to come do a Western for me. It's about Tombstone. And you show up ready to ride hell for leather. You know, get all set to go. And he hands you a cod piece and some tights. And you go, what's, oh, I'm the actor. Okay. That's not what I expected. But, uh, but it was a great character, Mr. Fabian. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that role of Josie was, uh, you know, the female lead, very strong female for that time, was uh, inspired by my sister, Lisa Zayn. Downstairs, you can see her. Um, she uh, and Kevin uh, uh, were together for a while right before he made that. And um, 
he she inspired that role and much of the ethos of that character and independence of Josie. Um, you can ask all about that if you so wish. It's pretty a uh, pretty amazing story. Um, next, I, I'm sure we're picking because of time, but the Phantom. Yes. Yeah. This, which I, I actually loved you in that role. I, I, I saw that in the theater and I was like, hey, this is fun, man. And uh, look where we are now with comic book superhero movies and the like. But uh, I used to read, you know, collected versions of the strips of that before that movie came out. So you know, I already know about that. And so it was really cool to see you embody that on the screen. Um, can you... How do Cliff Notes version of how you got that part? Yeah, sorry, I go on a bit, don't I? Um, <laughs> make it tight. I was uh, exposed to the uh, comic in Australia when I was doing Sniper, and um, they would they would issue uh, the, the ink on newsprint uh, reissues um, available in the newsstand along with their daily newspaper. Um, it, was, it was literally part of the national character and fabric of Australia and I think informed every young man and actor we have from that country who carry the kind of, you know, blokey moral compass and, you know, stature of, the, of a do-gooder. Um, and he, I, he just resonated with me. I, I thought this, you know, here's a superhero with no superpowers other than just being, you know, super humane. And uh, he was happy. He enjoyed being you know, a jungle lord and kind of like Batman of the Jungle, even though he was the first masked superhero uh, of the genre before Batman and Superman. And, um, not that Superman was masked, but you know, whatever. Um, and I wanted the role for years, uh, before, and it came around and I was maybe too young or, you know, didn't have the whatever traction at the time, and then it fell apart, and then by the time it came around, I was just right in the right place, right time, and knew the character so well um, that when I screen tested for it, I just kind of crushed it. I just, I just, I, I tried to be as true to the silhouette and behavior, you know, and the stance and posture and, you know, almost Errol, Errol Flynn-like, you know, joie de vivre and enjoyment. Thanks. Um, I tried to, it just didn't, it, it was in me, and, I, and what I love is when fans of The Phantom uh, talk about the very things that I love about the character, I see it in them. I see that nobility and that, and that love of goodness, you know, and decency and, and strength and moral compass in all of you, you know, when you step up. I just want to, you know... Young man or woman talks about what they love about, you know, or old man or woman, you know, talk about what they love about the Phantom. I see the Phantom in them. It's like it's really, you know, it's attainable because again, there's no superpowers. It's just life choices and uh, what makes what resonates with with oneself. And to to see how that character has grown in esteem uh, of late, <laughs> more than ever. Uh, is is not a surprise, but is a pleasant assurance. If you're not familiar with the movie, watch it. Share it with your kids. It's, you know, it's a it's it's a again. You can let classic cinema now. It's become a classic. Do uh, some of the heavy lifting. Um, it's a real in, great uh, instructional on you know a map to the minefield. Oh, well put. Um, no. So I wanted to ask about Titanic, of course. Um, we're going to get to you again. Because I have to, because people will shoot me afterwards. You know, yes, I mean, I'm, I'm good for time if you guys are. Sorry about that. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it short. So, Titanic. I've heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, instead of, like, how did you get the roles? So was it very grueling working on that? production, you know, like with all the stuff going on during... Yeah. But, but it's what I do, right? What do you expect? It's a movie about a sinking ship in cold water. It was, yeah, well, it was cold and it was, I don't know. So, so, it was hard, but yes, it was. I don't mean to belittle it, but that was the, that's what got you through it. You don't bellyache about those things. What do you think you signed on for? What about the Titanic? So how was Cameron to work, work, work for? 
That's the director. First in the water, last out. Uh, total respect. Yeah, every day. So you had no grounds to go, ah, you know, I'm cold, it's wet, I don't want to be wet. And, you know, it's like, sorry, what'd you sign on for? It's every movie is a military, you know, exercise. Yeah, me. <laughs> but I did it. And then I also chose that it would be very clever for the character to be like a cat. Cal would never get wet until he finally got wet while he was chasing him, trying to shoot him. And he'd step on anybody or anything. I thought, wouldn't it be clever? And I sold him on this idea. Wouldn't it be great if he never got wet on the Titanic? Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be ironic? I like, it would be so telling. The best thing about that character was we, you know, we, we would literally, you, they, he yells cut and, the t and we, we'd giggle like kids because we just adored the, the hubris of Cal, you know, who was well intended. He loved her, but he was, you know, um, maybe some bad programming, but he really carried the hubris of the age and the idea that um, he was so confident about getting off the boat, it didn't even register. It's like sinking, schminking, whatever, where's the girl? You know, it was just like such a not a non-issue, which is so bloody arrogant and, and funny in a way. It's just, it was entertaining to us because it was just clueless and, and um, seemed to work in a, in a curious way. And of course, you know, it's ripe for come up in some, its own tragedy and, you know, aha moment. Um, so it's, it seemed to work, but the process of playing that character and that guy with, you know, was, was something I relished every day and we, we extracted great joy from um, throughout. Okay, I'm going to take one magical question from the audience. Not you? Yes, ma'am. You might have been up for dirty dancing. Are you a great dancer that we don't know about? Um, well, thank you. If that's an invitation to dance, I accept. <laughs> See you at the party after. Uh, I, well, I did audition for dirty dancing, and I was down to, I think to, it was the final four. Um, Sarah Jessica Parker and I were a couple, and uh, Miss Gray and uh, Patrick were the other. And uh, it was, you know, I, I was amazed it went that far. My love of musicals was certainly being, you know, tempted to play Johnny Castle, which I thought was like, you know, also touched upon my other mad favorite genre of Elvis movies, which I adore. Yeah. So I was like, you know, that was just killer. But I was so young, man. I was... I was barely 19. I think Pat had a couple of years on me, as Johnny should have been. I thought I, I thought I was over my, not over my head, but I knew it was a stretch. But I got it as far as I probably could and should. And I think he was a Broadway hoofer. He was a properly trained dancer. I can move. I came out, you know, I was trained in musical theater, but I was winging it. And I think I danced to like Billy Idol in my audition or something. I know, it was just like dancing with myself. It's like, is, that, is this working? I hope this is working. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it got, you know, they, they entertained it as far as they probably should have. Um, that was amazing, it? So, you know. But yeah, it was, you know. That's something I didn't know. Our time is up. Please move. Thank Billy Zane for coming.